so you can get started now. So thanks everyone for joining us. This is the fifth in our series um, of demonstrations uh, from the Super Facility Project uh, this, um, this uh, late spring, early summer. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with the Super Facility Project, um, this is a project to coordinate work um, that's going on in the computing sciences area at Berkeley Lab to support uh, experimental science. Um, uh, on running on uh, large-scale networking and computing resources. So we've been holding a series of uh, demos to um, uh, show off and uh, advertise and solicit feedback on some of the tools and capabilities that have been developed as part of this project. This has included um, data management tools, um, uh, super facility API, um, uh, networking capabilities and uh, this uh, and edge computing uh, capabilities and so this uh, demonstration today uh, is around Jupiter and I'm going to pass it off now to uh, Matt and the rest of the team uh, to introduce themselves and introduce the topic thanks thank you Debbie um, so let me share my screen so we can get started Uh, so the topic today is uh, in, re in relation to the NERSC super, super Facility Project, um, Jupiter and HPC, and how, how we are um, working to upgrade that for experimental science. Um, I'm Matt Henderson. I'm a CSE in CRD. Uh, we've been working with some students, uh, William and Trevor, who are not actually on the project now, but um, did do a lot of work before, and, and of course, Trace and all. Um, and just a brief uh, description of the super facility model for those who may not be familiar with it yet. Um, so this is really aimed at trying to combine a lot of different um, facilities that are available, including experimental uh, computing data facilities, networking facilities, and try to um, use that and leverage expertise that we have, like people from the camera project or um, from the Jupyter community to combine all of those things and produce uh, a more um, integrated product where we can collect more data faster, hopefully better science and improve tooling. Um, so what are we doing uh, specifically for Jupiter and as part of this project? Uh, the main thrust of this is that we're trying to um, give users tools that are going to advance their science. And we're doing that by improving the HPC user experience uh, for people who are using Jupyter and NERSC um, through extensions, add-ons, things that are relevant, including uh, improving tools that are out there now within Jupyter and, and community um, and helping to integrate them better within HPC environment. And that development is driven by use cases within the experimental science community that we, people that we've been talking to. Um, and we want to move towards a more real-time experimental data analysis, um, scale up, notebook-based analyses to both share notebooks and also to run them and the environments that are needed to run. Uh, NERSC supports uh, a large number of different projects that have a lot of data. Some of it's uh, experimental and it sort of a range of projects including uh, light sources, microscopy, um, telescopes. Uh, we've been primarily uh, interfacing with ALS and NSEM, which I'll talk about a little bit more. But um, a key takeaway on the slide is that um, there was a survey conducted and where projects were asked to self-identify what their primary role was. And about 35% of them identified some role with experimental data. And so that's what we're trying to address is how to um, serve their needs. Um, so, NSIM stands for the Natural National Center for Electron Microscopy. They're part of the Molecular Foundry. Uh, next time you're in a lab, uh, these are the buildings that they're located in. Um, the NSIM does uh, primarily materials imaging and analytical characterization of materials. So they look for things like defects, um, nanostructures, uh, thin film surfaces, things like that. And then at the LS, um, that's a very broad range of activities that are supported there, but it's a synchrotron, which is a particle accelerator, and they support a lot of different science, uh, including X-ray, soft X-ray, hard X-ray, infrared, uh, ultraviolet, and other wavelengths of beam lines. Um, 
And just to give you an overview, if you're not familiar, this is what um, a process is like for a researcher who's traveling to a place like the ALS. Um, they design their experiments based on a hypothesis. They submit a proposal to that facility to request instrument time. They then get a reservation of instrument time uh, for those experiments. And then they travel there. And then in the case of ALS, you actually bring your equipment as well as your samples or things that you want to measure. Um, for something like NSEM, you might you would only bring the samples because they have the equipment they're going to use. Um, but you arrive at the facility, you set everything up, you do a test uh, of your apparatus in the ALS case, and then you perform your experiments in the window, the time window you have. And then later, you analyze your data. And usually that's not done on site when you collect the data. Um, you have just enough time to get a bunch of data and then you take it home with you a lot of times and you look at it later. And the problem with that is that you may not collect the data you need it, and you won't know until it's too late and you're already gone. Um, so we wanna to try to improve that process and make that a little bit better. Um, and so how are we doing that? Um, we are trying to move the standard towards a real-time experimental data analysis, which means being able to quickly process that data, visualize the results, and then also have uh, some type of interactive analysis that includes human in the loop. And so human in the loop just means that you have the ability to change what's happening. Um, it's not just a script and set activity. You actually go in and modify it. Um, and so how is this going to help? Um, this is going to help you by identifying whether or not you got that data, the critical data you needed. It gives you feedback that you can use to either conduct more experiments or um, get something done you didn't anticipate when you started. Uh, so, let me talk a little bit about Jupiter. Who doesn't know what Jupiter is? Uh, the short description of Jupiter would be to describe it as a framework for interactive compute. But if you want to break it down in components, um, then you would first start thinking about notebooks, which are the electronic notebook version uh, within Jupiter. They're documents that contain code and other things like images or markdown or other rich text elements. Um, there's a Jupyter kernel, which runs the code that's in a notebook. There's an interactive computing protocol that's defined by Jupyter that uh, determines how the kernel communicates with other components. Um, and this allows the kernel to communicate with different front ends, not just a single front end type. Um, and this will become a, a little more, um, make a little more sense in a minute. Um, then there's something called the Jupyter Notebook app, which is really it's sort of a combination of the front end and also the server um, that controls the execution of the kernel. So it starts and stops the kernel. Um, it, get, it handles the input and output for the kernel. Um, and then it also handles writing and reading the actual notebook files themselves. So an example of a, a notebook app and the one that you, if you've used the Nurse Jupyter you've seen with JupyterLab, this is the most recent incarnation of the Jupyter Notebook app. Um, the previous one is referred to now as the Classic Notebook. Um, and in this interface, you have a combination of features. Um, so it's not just notebooks. You can sort of combine a lot of different uh, activities in the same window. It makes it more like a development, integrated development environment, uh, where you can have terminals, uh, text editors, many other things. And one of the advantages is that there's a large improvement in the extensibility of this system compared to the previous system where you can now modify the UI. You can create dashboards, you can create more interactive widgets that were hard to do before. Um, and so why are we uh, using Jupyter and why, why is Jupyter an emphasis here? So um, it was primarily developed to support science from the beginning. There's a long history that goes all the way back to IPython um, and Fernando Perez, who's at UC Berkeley. Um, and the uh, Jupyter Notebooks allow scientists to capture and publish their analyses. Um, and you can include a lot of different things, including your equations, graphs, any notes or annotations you may have, as well as interactive widgets that you can use to explore the data. Um, and then Jupyter kernels are important for us because since scientists um, tend to be a multi-language community, having the ability to run different uh, programming languages via kernels is important. As, and ultimately, it's useful for us because it's a framework for inter interactive computing and 
there's a large ecosystem and community out there for Jupyter. It's become the de facto data science tool that people use. And so it's very handy for us to also use for science because there's a lot of coincidence there. Um, at NERSC, we have a Jupyter Hub deployment, which is the Jupyter multi-user environment for running your notebook apps. Um, there's a configurable spawner type that Jupyter Hub supports. NERSC uses the SSH spawner. Um, the auth is configurable, and um, the apps run on the login nodes by default, although you can request access to other resources. So for instance, you could um, run a notebook on a, a single node. You can get a dedicated node that will run your notebook server. And you could also request access to GPU resources if you're doing machine learning, deep learning, or some other activity like that. But there are challenges. It's not without, uh, without any challenges here. So primarily the big uh, item is that we have a batch queue system. And this is not designed for interactive work. Um, the NERSC queue policy also isn't always um, super compatible with some of the tools out there and how they're uh, intended to work. So an example of that would be DAS job queue, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, and you do have things like the interactive queue now um, with Jupyter. So if you're using a notebook, you can uh, get an S alloc into an interactive queue that you can use while you're using your notebook. That's very useful, but um, it's somewhat limited. You can, only, you can only scale so far with that. Um, and the other big item is that the Jupyter ecosystem has really been more oriented towards uh, cloud usage, which is very natural uh, relative to the history of things and how it worked out. But we want to be able to try to adapt pieces of that where we can to the HPC environment and also fill in gaps where they're needed because there will be places where the HPC environment is just unique compared to a cloud solution and, and how do we address that. So I'm, I'm just gonna give a quick overview of what I'm going to be talking about. So um, these are the things we've been doing or will be doing uh, to address some of these. So we've done some enhancements already to the Jupyter um, instance that you may have seen. Um, I'm gonna talk a bit about scaling up scientific analyses um, using DASC and I'll show uh, a use case with Ensign where, where we were able to parallelize some, uh, a step for them. Um, and then I'm going to talk about sharing and running Jupyter Notebooks at NERSC and a couple of different things that are available now in, in sort of a prototype state that um, you can use to um, share notebooks and run them on port. So for the Jupyter enhancements that have already been done, um, Trevor, one of the students that worked with us, he's now at Apple, um, he worked on a couple of enhancements that you've probably seen. There's a favorites and a recents uh, extension that were added that allow you to more easily navigate um, when you're in Jupyter. And this is actually kind of important because the favorites one in particular, there were problems navigating for the home directory. You would end up in the root directory and you'd be hard to get back. So that's been fixed. And then there was also this recents that was added. So you can quickly find things that you've been seeing recently rather than having to go dig through the file system every time. Um, and we have some more things that are coming, including uh, an extension that will give better Slurm support when you're using Jupyter, uh, Jupyter um, something called clone notebooks, which I'm gonna talk about, and also binder. Um, and so for scaling up uh, scientific analyses, we're, um, I'm primarily talking about here just to give some context. These are notebook-based Python uh, pieces of code where you either have a long running notebook cell or you have some repetitive task where you're processing a lot of data using the same functions over and over again. Um, and we would like to be able to have something that's easy to use, doesn't uh, require significant refactoring, that has uh, an improved interactivity for Jupyter users, it's interoperable with other tools in the ecosystem, it, you can debug and things like that. And so um, something like DASP does check a lot of boxes there. Um, and so DASP is a, is a distributed computing um, package for Python um, that gives you sort of that easier path to parallelizing your code. Um, it has a core uh, component, which is composed of these big data collection types. So it has an array type, data frame, a bag. Um, it also has something called DASP delayed, which 
uh, basically gives you a lazy evaluation of your function calls. Um, and then it also has feature support, so you can get a non-blocking call and then check on it later. It's, it's equivalent to promises in the JavaScript world, if you're familiar with that. Um, and the distributed portion of Dask is composed of uh, a scheduler with workers that runs, so it's a cluster, essentially. Um, and there is a little bit of overhead for any scheduler, and in this case, it's about 200 microseconds per task. So you do have to be mindful of how, how many tasks you're trying to shove at the scheduler at once. You can't overwhelm it if they run too quickly. Um, and then there's a dash job queue, which um, can be useful if you um, want to run things on a batch queue system. But there are some limitations uh, relative to NERSC um, and how uh, job queue was developed. It seems like it's a bit more oriented towards um, smaller cluster sizes. Roland and I attended a um, DAS developer workshop and after talking to people it seemed like uh, that was a more common use case was that people who were using DAS job queue tended to be doing smaller things. So it really if you're if you're doing something big um, or you want a larger DAS cluster, DAS job queue is probably not what you want to use. More likely you're going to want to do what they refer to in the DAS world as manual startup which involves batch scripting. And I have a little star there because it's on my to-do list to um, put that in GitHub, uh, a sort of a template for how you start something in the batch script. And then we have the uh, Dask Jupyter Lab extension, which you may also have seen. Uh, it's currently deployed on the Jupyter Hub, uh, the Nerf Jupyter Hub. And it allows you to connect to a Dask cluster, visualize what's happening with the task graph, uh, do some visual debugging, um, and you can either run a local cluster with it directly and launch one, um, or you can configure it to use Dask Job Queue. Um, the caveat there is that Dask Job Queue is not actually installed into the default Python environment, so you'd have to have your own conda, but you can do it. Um, and it's also possible to uh, access a cluster that's been started via batch job separately. So uh, for scaling up Python with Dask, I was going to show a, a video that Roland actually recorded, um, cosmology example. And then I was going to talk a bit about um, Dask and Dask job queue, and then show the dashboard so you can give a live demo there. So let me jump into that um, quickly. So, Uh, so here, um, what's happening is uh, we're loading a catalog of data um, that's sitting on the project file system. Um, and then we're going to do a bit of processing. And in the end, you'll, we'll get a hex bin plot, a nice hex bin plot um, of the data after it's been processed. So um, right now, what's happening is the, um, we're setting up the client that's going to connect to the cluster. Down here at the bottom in the terminal, the cluster is actually running. Um, and then we're going to start executing um, our function here. And notice he's used the delayed call here. Um, so the delayed call gives you a lazy evaluation of the task graph, which means that um, Dask is dynamically building a task graph or a Directed asynchronous graph from the different function calls. And if you use delayed, it helps Dask to um, better order the execution of things. Jump ahead to the demo. Um, there we go. Okay, so he's got a cluster started up. He's, uh, we're connecting to the dashboard. Um, which is actually going to be in a separate browser window. Now you can actually do some of this with a lab extension, but um, it's also nice sometimes to be able to get a bigger view in a separate window of the task graph and other components of that. Um, so what we're looking at now is a task stream and a task stream. And once he starts executing, you'll see some of this being populated. 
So we're it's reading in data, and then after the data is being read, we'll start seeing the tasks being submitted, and the task graph will start being built, they'll look a bit more complicated. Um, and this, the nice thing about looking at this is that you can see if there are issues in um, the processing. If there's big gaps between things, that means something is probably not optimized. You're waiting on something longer than you should be. Or if you see a lot of red happening all over the place, um, then you might have to look into some different optimizations. Um, so now we're running, um, these are the read catalog steps. Um, and then that will start quickly translating into actual computation here. And so you get a live, uh, pretty, pretty much real time view of your processing as it's happening, um, which is very handy when you're developing something, but also can be handy if there's a problem. It gives you a way to sort of diagnose where you need to start looking. Um, you can also see all the workers that are running, and here's the nice hexpin plot that was, that was created here. Uh, you can see the um, a profile, so I think we're going to go, yeah. So you can get a plane graph profile of the execution where you can see percentages of different function calls um, that tell you how much time was spent at a particular step. And so that will help you if you're trying to understand why something is taking longer than you would expect it to, or if you're just trying to understand um, how your workflow is running. Is it running efficiently or are there problems? Um, so now let me jump in, after I finish that, let me jump into um, showing a live demo here. So this is a notebook where I'll be using a Dask job queue at first to um, run some tasks. And so the difference between the manual setup and Dask job queue, as I mentioned before, is that Dask job queue has sort of this built-in functionality of it knows how to talk to the batch queue. And what it will do is it will submit um, jobs for you to learn based on what, how you configure it. And so in this case, um, I have a reservation, so it makes it easier. The challenging part of using Dask job queue is when you don't have a previous reservation and you're just sort of waiting on the queues to pick up workers. So, and there's, there's a mismatch between how long you have to wait for the workers to start versus how much work you can actually get done. Um, so let me go ahead and run this. Matt, could you bump up the font? Oh, it's still not big enough. Okay, sure, yes. Yeah, yeah. Oh, just, uh, yeah just go up to one oh, no. Yes, of course, I'm sorry. Um, I was already, I thought it was already pretty large, but um, I have a yeah. 4K monitor, so yeah. it's a little more to engage. Yeah, this, much, like this is much better on my laptop, so thanks. Okay. I apologize. Um, okay, so uh, let me go ahead and run that. So what's going to happen is um, it's going to write out a, a job script, which let's see should be starting here momentarily. If not, I'll skip to something else. This is the danger of a live demo. Suddenly it stopped working. Um, okay, that's odd. Well, so um, here on the right um, is the uh, view of the of something that I was running um, using Dask, and uh, so this is the task screen. It's showing how long each of the tasks were taking. This is from the Intune demo that I'll do in a little bit. Um, let's see if, if this is going to come back or not. Oh, okay. All right, so that's not going to work right now. All right, so I will skip to the next one rather than uh, labor, the labor. Did it redirect you back to log in there, Matt? What's that? Did it, re did it do that redirect to you to send you back to log in? It looks like, yeah. It, I think so you, if you re-authenticate it, it will probably be okay. Yeah, okay. And you're on Jupiter, not Jupiter stage. Is that intent, intentional? That is correct. So this is the, that's right. So this is the, um, the regular Jupiter. I will do a demo a bit later that 
is on. I think okay. Just is, double but, checking. Yeah, yeah, but for now, I'm actually using uh, the one that everyone else is using normally. Uh, apologize. Let me see if I can get this back up. Let's see. Okay. So apparently, my server got read somehow. Let me try running again and see if I can get back to where we were. There we go. Okay. All right. So, um, so here's the JavaScript that it wrote out based on the config that I passed it. Um, and it, so it's writing on an SBatch script uh, that's going to call Python and uh, run Dask, run Dask workers. Um, I scaled the cluster to two workers, essentially, or two two instances. Um, so we're going to wait for that to start up. It shouldn't take too long. So I may have already started. Yeah, I think it's already started. So first I'm, um, I'm creating this uh, Rosenbrock um, plot here. And then uh, just to show just a quick demonstration. So what happened was these points were being generated um, for each task. Um, and that's what actually ran. It ran really fast, so I mean, we missed the actual run. But um, <laughs> if I go to um, go back up, I can connect to the actual cluster here. If I, it's a bit clunky still, but you can put in the proxy information for this. I don't know. This all looks too hard to be useful. It's a little, it, it is a bit clunky. Um, there are some yeah. definitely some improvements that can be made here. Yeah. So I mean, just to take a step back, right? I mean, this is essentially just your notebook, and you could ignore all of this other stuff, and all you're doing is essentially starting up a job in Dask. So if you go up to the top there, yeah, right, um, right. All you're doing is go up. Um, right, so you're just saying cluster equals, and you just essentially specify the batch file, and then it's running, and then you have um, a bunch of code that you just essentially wrap with a Dask um, decorator, and it launches it on those remote things. So, yeah, I mean, it really, it's actually very simple um, compared to like, for instance, if you were if you wanted to develop your code with MPI, there's a lot more involved typically than here where you can basically take your vanilla Python code as is do a, a, some very small modifications and you're running it in parallel. Um, that's the advantage of using Dask here. The clunkiness that I'm talking referring to is uh, is connecting to the, um, the extension when the cluster has, wasn't actually started by the extension. There's still there's still some some user stuff to fix there. Um, yeah, so if I could if I could hop in to yeah. expand on that a little bit. Um, getting Dask working on an HPC system requires us to do a little bit of adaptation of, um, of the tool. And um, there are a lot of assumptions that kind of were baked into the development of the tool that, you know, there are hooks or there are abstractions that we can use to, um, uh, you know, to make them work on HPC. Um, but um, it falls to us to kind of do that in collaboration with other developers at other HPC centers. And then every place is a little bit different. So um, Matt mentioned, for instance, Dask job queue. Um, did you throw the slash status on the end of that URL there, Matt? Uh, yes, I believe I did. Okay. Right. Uh, yes, I did. Right. So, um, uh, so everybody's a little bit different and everybody has uh, different opinions about how things should work. And Dask job queue is a perfect example of this. When we say, oh, we're at HPC Center and we're trying to run Dask, everybody says, oh, you need to run Dask job queue. Um, it's just the wrong thing for us. 
Um, a manual startup is a lot better. Waiting around for workers to start up for interactive data analytics, it's just waiting for the queue. That's not gonna work here. Other places maybe have lower utilization that allows them to build up um, clusters of workers this way. It just, I don't think it's a solution for us. So that means that we have to look at the manual setup and we have to kind of figure out how to um, uh, make that a little bit more manageable for users. Um, I will say that um, what, what Matt's doing here or actually what people can do right now on Jupyter, um, not like not interacting with the batch queue, you can still run Dask. Um, you just can't run it really big for really long um, there. But we're working on trying to figure out which of these tools, because there are um, a number of different choices out there, Dask being one. Dask probably being the one that most people have heard about and like and has a lot of developers behind it. For a while, the chief developer was working at NVIDIA and it's part of the Rapids ecosystem. It's how they achieve distributed, uh, um, you know, do distributed data analytics. It's, it's basically built on top of Dask right now. Um, so we're, this is a work in progress. I mean, a lot of Jupyter stuff is almost always work in progress until we kind of figure out what, where the users are and how to meet them where they are. Um, so, you know, I find, I find that like it took a while for me to learn how this stuff worked to get it to work and even make that first video was probably a day or so. Um, but once it works, it's actually a lot of fun. And the task stream stuff that you see, the, the, the visualization, the profiling is extremely useful. It's not just pretty and it's not just fun to watch. Um, it really tells you, oh, I should be persisting the data here. I need to be changing the number of um, workers that I'm using uh, or how I'm distributing the data over the workers. It's extremely useful feedback. It's real-time profiling, which is kind of neat. So let's see if we can um, get a view of this, how this running this time. I think it did it. Yeah, but it should. There should still yeah. be. So, I mean, in the interest of time, I think it's probably, yeah. I mean, this is not that yeah. different from the video you showed, right? So, right. Um, I can skip this. Yeah, yeah. we'll keep going. Um, yeah, okay. This was working better yesterday. <laughs> um, not that it, that it helps, but um, let me get back to my slides here. Yeah, I mean, I think that the takeaway here is that what you're really doing is just hooking up a Dask parallel backend that'll let you execute Python functions remotely on compute nodes. That's right. And so it could be, um, it could, the cluster could have been started by Dask job queue or it could be something you started manually, but the actual, um, the rest of the code doesn't really change, right? You have a Dask client, it's connected to a cluster, however you started it, and then you just, submit work to it, right? And that's the beauty of it. It's, it's actually fairly simple um, to get going. Um, so for the NSAM uh, use case, we had, uh, after we talked to NSAM, it turns out that um, they had a few different uh, notebooks that they were using or as workflows essentially for users who were wanting to do data analysis after they collected their microscopy data. Um, but they had one, in particular that was actually quite long and it was uh, basically it was running in serial and it was effectively um, an embarrassingly parallel task where you were running the same function across many different slices of the same data set um, and so this was a fairly natural um, pattern to use something like Dask um, and so you have to process all the patterns it doesn't matter what order they're in um, a 65 gigabyte data set for them on their workstation took about 11 hours to complete. So it's not it's super interactive when your notebook takes 11, 12 hours to run. Um, and then the 300 gigabyte data set that they had, which was the largest they had collected, they hadn't tried that on the workstation because they were assuming it was gonna take a really long time. Um, 
and they knew that they needed to do something about it. So we uh, we developed a parallel implementation and improved the runtime for the 65 gigabyte data set. So now with a modest number of HPC nodes, you can get that down to a couple of minutes from the original 11 hours. So it's pretty substantial improvement for them. And you're definitely going from, I'll wait till tomorrow to I'll have it ready in a few minutes. And so this is enabling them to be able to um, reduce the data that um, they hand off to the user. So it's already been um, pre-processed for them. They don't have hard drives full of data um, and they can take it home and, and do their further analysis with it. So let me jump into the Ansem demo. Hopefully I'm not plagued by demo problems. Again, but we'll see. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and start the uh, parallel, ver or I'm sorry, the serial version of this, the original code. Um, and I'll walk through it a bit and then we'll skip over to the parallel after the serial starts the, the big step. Um, and then I'll run that and we'll, we'll do a comparison. Um, so what's happening here for Ensign is they're doing something called um, scanning transmission electron microscopy, which basically is they've got a focus beam of electrons, they're scanning it over the sample. Um, and it's a, in the case of 4D STEM, they're using the 2D grid to sample all, all the way across the, uh, the sample. Um, and each sample point, you get these uh, uh, diffraction patterns here. Um, and the computationally expensive step is essentially computing the peak of these. Uh, once you compute that, you can determine things like um, the structure of the material. Um, you can use angles of the deflected electrons to uh, determine properties. Um, and so it's very useful for materials analysis. Um, this is a um, chart showing their data rates. So um, the old school camera using film was one gigabyte per hour. And now um, they're at, with their custom uh, 40 stem detector, they're at about 200 terabytes per hour. Um, and so realistically, an experiment is probably a few minutes at a time. But the data collection rate and the size, the amount of pixels that you're generating is increasing dramatically. Um, and so they're already having a problem here which is the current data set, it's using this K2 um, detector, and that's at four and a half terabytes per hour. So they knew there was a problem when they were going from four and a half to 200, and they weren't quite able to keep up with this yet. So um, this particular um, example is a copper um, thin film that's been irradiated by high energy ions. Um, and so when you're scanning across, there's some local atomic spacing shifts that um, move the disks in the diffraction patterns. And so you wanna be able to locate those disks to really measure the spacings to determine the properties. Um, and so this is the, the microscope that they're using. Um, it's running at 400 frames per second. Um, and so I'm loading the data from scratch. Um, it's probably already running by now, so I'll get there. Um, this is a view of one of the sample diffraction patterns. Um, we would typically, you would look at some of this data before you started to kind of tune in the parameters, make sure that you've got your parameters set right before you process the whole data set. Um, you would look at the vacuum probe before you actually put the sample in, so you have something to compare to. Uh, you get a line profile. Um, and then you would just peek at some of the diffraction patterns from the data with the sample, just to make sure your parameters are okay. Um, you run it on a little bit of data to get an example of what that's going to look like. And then we're going to go ahead and run the entire data set. That's already executing, let's see where we're at. So we're at 0.3% complete. It probably started like a minute ago. Um, so let me go ahead and jump over to the parallel side. I'll start running that. Um, while we're waiting for the serial um, process to continue. And when I get down to the parallel step, I'll explain a bit about what's happening there in relation to DAS. Okay, so I'm at the parallel step now. Um, so what's happening here is uh, the code is refactored a little bit 
to incorporate a Dask implementation of the function that was performing uh, slowly in serial fashion. And um, what we did was we kept the same interface to the code, but now you can basically say, okay, I'm using Dask, I want to run this in parallel versus running it the way you always did before, which would just be a serial run. Um, so the only thing really that's happening here, and I'll show the serial version. So here's a serial version, you pass in your parameters that you were set. Um, and then the Dask version is, is identical other than that, you're also passing in some information about how to connect to Dask, where to write the data, um, things like that. Um, and so we'll go ahead and start this. My cluster is already running. Um, and that should start once we catch up to this cell. Um, what's going to happen is uh, that data is going to be read in. Let's go ahead, once we get the client set up, I'll, I'll try connecting to the, uh, the graph again. And we'll see if we can watch something actually happen this time. Um, in version, you're just iterating through all the different slices in the parallel version. Um, based on the number of workers, we're dividing up the amount of data as equally as possible and then spreading that out uh, to the different nodes so that the work can happen in parallel. And that makes a pretty dramatic improvement in the run. Right now, I think we're still waiting for some of the data to load. Oh yeah, we'll wait up here. Once this can- So Matt, since, since this can run in the background, why don't we, yeah. continue, since we're at 12.45 already, let's sure. go through the rest of the talk and come back and check in on how our um, job sure, is Sure, yeah. yeah, okay. So, um, right. And Thanks. I guess it started, you could see it starting to do some stuff here, but yeah. Yeah, it'll take, a, it will still take a little while. Um, it, it'll take, it takes a couple of minutes to run. So we'll, I'll, I'll, do, I'll go for a couple of minutes and then I'll get back. Um, so now let me just get into the, um, the idea of sharing notebooks and what the different mechanisms are. So notebooks are files, so you can share notebooks using any mechanism that you would normally share a file. So there's nothing special there um, in that aspect of it. You can use the typical NERSC data sharing uh, mechanisms. You can use the GitHub or Google Drive or whatever you want, or Unix file permissions. Um, you can put it in GitHub. You can use some other tools which are special for Jupyter, which I'll talk about a little bit, uh, MBViewer and Binder. Um, some of the use cases that we've been uh, encountering as we talk to people is that um, people that want to share, they either tend to want to share with other people within their project, it's a word private share, they're collaborating, um, or it's a public share where maybe you've got, um, if you're in the case of a user facility, you have users who are coming in, they don't have a lot of coding experience, but they do understand the data and they do understand um, how to set parameters. And so if you give them uh, a pre-worked analysis where all they have to do is plug in the parameters and the data, then they can run that um, and perform their data analysis. And so in SIM, both in SIM and ALS, these are, these are um, one of the use cases that we're exploring. And then in addition to that, you have the sort of, I want to share or publish my analysis to the world or to other science, scientists out in the community beyond just NERSC. Um, so like for instance, you might put it on GitHub. Um, now, once you've shared the notebook, what does it take to actually run that? You of course have the notebook file itself, but then you also need a compatible Jupyter kernel which executes the code that's in the notebook, um, which is a combination of both uh, an executable for the the kernel and also a spec that tells it where is the ex executable what parameters to extend to it, etc. Um, and then you also need the execution environment that uh, would support what you need to run the notebook. So on the right hand side you can see just a simple diagram there where it's the notebook plus a kernel and then plus some execution environment and maybe it's con or maybe it's pip or some other um, mechanism. And then of course any data you may have. So MD viewer is um, a Jupyter project tool that is really for publishing or um, sharing notebooks sort of with the community. And it allows you to maintain a curated collection so you can see this, this uh, landing page where they have like a set where the, they're predefined that you can set up. Um, and it's meant to be a publication mechanism. When you visit one of these 
you'll get um, a fully rendered notebook, assuming it was saved with the outputs, um, that you can preview before you do anything with it. Um, and we talked to Peter Parente and Dan Allen from Brookhaven. They have both used this for different uh, purposes in sharing notebooks. Um, and so we took that work. William, uh, another of our students, worked on uh, an extension that any of you are called Clone Notebooks that allows you to copy the notebook and the kernel spec um, into your home directory or the path that Jupyter would be looking for in the case of the kernel spec. Um, and so this works okay on for your system. Um, and uh, this runs as a service in Jupyter Hub, so it's running alongside the Jupyter Hub deployment. And um, in order for this to work, you of course have to have a pre-built Python environment. So you have to have your Conda set up and it's public or available for other people you want to share it with. But at that point, you can point them to this and tell them where your notebook is at um, with the kernel spec and they can just copy it over and it will work. Um, so that's pretty nice. Um, and so let's go ahead and take a look at that. Um, so that's actually running on right now on Jupyter Stage. Oh, no. okay. So from here, um, there's a services um, menu item now where you can access MV Viewer. It takes you here. Um, I can input um, a GitHub repo that I have set up with um, a notebook that's ready to be cloned for notebooks. So this is a science notebook. Um, this is my fork. The original is here. And it's a frequency domain EM experiment. So it's like a steel casing inside of a hole and you're simulating um, the resistivity in the electric field. Um, and so I can click go on this and that will um, take me to the repo, uh, the GitHub repo. And if I navigate to the right spot, I can clone this uh, notebook into my home directory. Um, and so what will happen is I will get um, a copy of that notebook in my home directory that's already set with the right kernel. And then we can just run. So the caveat here is I have, I have a content environment that supports what the notebook needs to run. Yeah, so the idea is that you have, um, basically you're, you're telling it that here's the conda environment that the project is using, here's the notebook, and it'll just clone that over. And now you've got um, a running notebook with all the right libraries and packages um, that, that it's pointing to. Okay, let me just jump back very quickly and see where we're at here. This is probably already done. Um, um, yeah, it looks like it's done, but I didn't get an output telling me how long it took. It was a little, no, something happened. Okay, something happened. I don't know, maybe because I left. Um, so let me run this again, um, the notebook. Let's do a kernel restart. So the, the interesting thing, once I get a bit lower here, is that um, there will be some interactive plots that we can look at. So here's the casing here we're looking at. Um, and you know, it's a, it's a Jupyter, typical Jupyter notebook, it's got some plots in it. Um, there's some interactive widgets that are included here. So I can, um, I can change this a bit and um, look at some different aspects of it. And it works, right? I didn't have to do anything else. So that's the nice thing about phone notebooks. Let me jump back in real quick before we run out of time, because we're getting close. Um, then uh, let me talk a bit about Binder. So um, Binder is another tool from the Jupyter Project um, that allows you to share your notebooks, in this case, with a custom environment. So you would store, typically store your, um, 
notebook in a Git, Git repo, either GitHub or something else, and then you would add files to that repo with the notebook that define the dependencies that are needed to run your notebook. Um, so this would be like a requirements.txt or it would be an environment.yaml for Conda or, or or maybe if you have additional packages you need to install into um, like um, Linux packages, you could include an app.txt that would um, be installed into a Docker image that's um, built from that. And so there's a, a site called mybinder.org, which is a, a public resource where you can do this, but it has limited compute and data allowances. Um, and then the Docker image that it creates from your repo is stored there within the in my binder environment, so you can't really get it out or do anything with it outside of that context. It's not really appropriate for your HPC workflow. It's just something that allows you to publicly share things with people outside um, for a more limited workflow. So what I've been working on as a in a separate project, it's actually not funded by this, but through Oscar, um, but is related, so that's why it's here. You have a prototype that allows you to do something almost identical. Um, and run the same uh, repo that you would normally run in my binder at NERSC. Um, and so the unique thing there compared to clone notebooks is that it gives you more flexibility. You can include things that are hard to do with clone notebooks. For instance, if you have a custom JupyterLab extension that you wanted to work on for your project um, and share with other users, right now that's kind of hard to do with the current um, JupyterLab set up the way it is but it's much easier to do with this um, sort of recipe, right? You can set up your repo that has all the dependencies, including your extensions. Everything gets built and combined into a Docker image, and then people can just run that even through the our Jupyter Hub. So let me, I'm just gonna show a video of that. Um, So um, this is the mybinder.org website where you can put in a URL for a repo and it will um, build a Docker image and then run it for you. So um, the example is this gravity inversion notebook, which is another notebook from the same, uh, the resistive casing notebook is another one from the same author, Lindsay Hay. Um, she works with Fernando. And um, so here I'm running it on my binder. Um, I forked her repo and I made a couple of a modification so that it would work inside Jupyter Lab because uh, by default my binder still works with the classic notebook. Um, and then I can run that. Um, and what's what's different compared to the other one that I ran is that this one, so right here, um, what you're seeing down here, this is actually a custom Jupyter Lab extension that was built into the Docker image that allows you to view HTTP uh, slices of data. Um, so this is an example of something that you could do. And so here, um, actually, ooh, that's fast. Um, so I was comparing uh, two different um, instances of the simulation data. So we had one at the beginning of the model and one at the end. And it's just a quick comparison showing that you can compare more than one. Um, this is how it actually works. You take something from GitHub, you would, on your laptop, build a Docker image, push it to the NERSC image registry, Docker image registry, and then use Shifter to actually run it with JupyterHub. Um, and so that allows you to take anything that's built to run on my binder and it will work on um, NERSC with the caveat that you might have to do something special to make sure that it works in Jupyter Lab if there's some widgets or uh, extensions that are needed. Um, Hey, Matt, we're running low on time, so maybe yeah. we just uh, open it up for questions and sort of let the video Absolutely. play out in the background. Run. Yeah. So, um, yes, please, any questions, um, happy to answer questions. I know that was a lot, sorry. <laughs> it's a lot to digest, probably. So here, this is actually running on NERSC. So not cheating, it's really jupyter.nurse. Um, and the extension works. I didn't cheat and have Roland install it for me somewhere. 
And again, the idea here is that you've got a Git repo that essentially packages it up into a Docker image, pushes it up to NERSC, and now you're running it via shifter um, as, as a notebook. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to talk about anything. So if you have any questions about Jupyter or Jupyter Hub or anything that I talked about or you had a question about something else, feel free to chime in. Matt, you may have said something about it and I missed it. If, if, is there any thought about sort of turning, kind of making it easy to create the artifacts that you were showing with the binder piece? So like if you had a functional kind of set of analysis to make it easy to kind of create a repo from that and push it. And so it's now ready to sh share with others through that mechanism or something. Uh, like you that. mean the image or you mean uh, the, from the repo standpoint? From the repo, I think it'd be from the repo standpoint. Yeah. Imagine someone yeah. has some analysis already on, on at NERSC and they want to then kind of push. Yeah, yeah, out. so um, well, well so, so there are questions about how to deal with yeah. large data if you're putting in GitHub, yeah. right? Um, that's a separate problem from what I was saying yeah. here. Um, I, I do think that that's an issue, though, that has to be explored. How do you deal with large data if you're sharing it out with other people? Do they access it at NERSC? You know, what do they do? Right. That is a question, sort of an open question. I have, I don't have a solution yeah. for you. Um, In fact, it's the other way around, right? One would actually point, I think the reason we developed this is that the, so Binder sort of works typically in the cloud where you don't, really have direct access to your data. You just have small instances of data. If you do need to run it adjacent to your data, the idea is that you would have some t a tool like this that can actually launch this at, at NERSC where your data is sitting um, so you have direct access to it. Ideally, you wouldn't have to move the data, right? It would just stay where it's at. So, so yeah, the, the, the whole point of this is to launch the notebooks where the data is rather than the other way around. All right. Hey, that uh, this is Peter. I have one, one, a quick question. Um, how do you design a notebook that, that hides all the codes? Because uh, typically the average, say, crystallography or um, microscopy users um, do not either know or want to do any programming. Is there any way that we can just hide everything yeah. and just yeah. have a go button? The, the yes. short answer is yes. Um, it's a little bit, the longer answer, we can talk offline, but yeah. there's, well, so there's, there's, there's yeah. things you like so to do that. There, there's a tool called Vola, which we're starting to prototype um, in the Jupyter environment. And that, that's basically what you said, which is a um, front end uh, that, that hides all the code and only exposes the visual elements. And it's a, uh, it, it isn't, it's something we're playing with. I think part of it is it, it's, so, so we have an early use case for that and we'll, we'll be prototyping it. And it, it's, if we can get it to work right at the NERSC environment, it's something we might be able to roll out to users. Perfect. I just saw, I saw a link based it. Thank you. I'll have a look at it. One little tidbit that I might offer as experience working with Spot is that a lot of the work that a lot of the visiting scientists wanted to do was, was, was pretty simple or pretty straightforward. They were pretty happy with something that could just do some near real-time analysis and give them feedback as to how their samples are going. And one of the directions we were trying to go in but never got to is kind of thinking as of their analysis that they wanted to do as somewhat equivalent to like, you know, the sample that they would bring to the beam line or even some of the equipment and work with these scientists ahead of time. And I think there's a real opportunity here with a lot of the tools that you guys are using to do that, where if you could, you know, ship them out a notebook ahead of time and say, here's, you know, get, get a notebook like this working. And then when you show up, we will be able to drop it into the existing <laughs> systems um, and give you that real note. That way you get testing ahead of time, you build up the expectations as to what the visiting scientists will be able to achieve. And, uh, yeah, I think that's more or less what we, you know, sort of had in mind with these clone notebooks and notebook sharing tools. Yeah, yeah. This all, this all looks really, really interesting. I, I just am a little bit concerned that you're probably going to overwhelm the non-CS yeah, yeah. Uh, people because I, I love this. I think this is fascinating, but I, I can sense that. Well, I think, I think this is, a, this is a step along the way, right? So we yeah. will progress more towards the low-code solutions where 
you know, things like dashboards are more prevalent. But for now, this is the, the baby step to get you from I can't do it to I can do it, right? Yeah, and I, I'd, I'd actually say that I think some of this was also the, a function of the, the sort of demos themselves where they were code heavy demos. We could more or less do the same things where we hide a lot of that from you. Um, it, and so I think some of that is just on our, our choice of examples maybe. And, and, and I think what you're saying, Keith, is actually still true. I think we could do all these things and, and we could probably do a better job hiding some of the complexity when we're, especially for things that are canned and people can just run off the bat. The other thing that could be really helpful is having this, having something that's somewhat canned, you know, a container you could hand to the scientists ahead of time and say, um, you know, this is, you know, get it working in here or let's work on getting a container that we can just drop in that will do your analysis. Um, that way you can kind of like, yep. I don't, thinking, thinking of it as somewhat more analogous to the sample that they're bringing or any of the equipment that they're bringing to a particular facility. Yeah, and I think what you said is more or less what we, where we want to be, I think. Great. So we're, we're, I think we want exactly those things. Cool. All right, I'm going to have to wrap things up, I'm afraid. Um, we're getting into the, uh, the next hour. So I want to thank our presenters again. Um, thanks to Matt and uh, Shresh and Rollin and as well um, for a nice demo. Um, and so this is the last uh, demo in the current series of super facility um, demonstrations. But look out for um, demos, demos coming up in the future. We're going to be scheduling more um, later this year as we have new functionality to, to demonstrate for you. So thanks, everyone, and have a, a good afternoon. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Later.